I am your host, Ms. Rufo, and today I am joined by panelists and Algonquin seniors, Joe Green, Ella Key, and Jake Piotrowski. Cell phones, what used to only make phone calls and send text messages, now does our gaming, dating, banking, shopping, movie playing, and health monitoring. Teens and adults are consistently accessing their phones during school, work, and family time. How is this reliance impacting productivity? What are the positive aspects of cell phone use? And what are the psychological impacts of cell phone use? These are the questions I will be asking my panel of teenagers today. How do teens manage the complex land of smartphones? Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. It's a privilege to have you as guests. Um, we're going to talk about probably one of your favorite things, cell phones. And um, I read some statistics that kind of shocked me, but that's why you're here. I need to get your opinion on this. Uh, statistic number one, the average age for a teen or a person to acquire a cell phone is 12.1, according to statistics. The average age a person uses is an iPad is two. So I did a little research and I found out that PBS recommends iPad use for the first time in preschool, which I found shocking. I thought PBS was gonna say no iPads until high school, no cell phones until high school. So I am an old person. Please fill me in on what you think about the age uh, average age for cell phone and iPad usage. Ella, how about, how about you? Well, for me, I got my phone at the age of 12, so that statistic is pretty good. Um, I thought it was good for me because it was about the time that I was like going out and like doing things. I could text my mom, hey, you can pick me up now. Um, I think, too, for an iPad, though, is way too young. I don't think kids need to be looking at that yet. Um, go outside, maybe play a little bit. Mm, that'd be nice. Learn yeah. how to talk. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Walk. Maybe. So um, I got my first phone a little later than that. I, was, I think I was 14 when I got my first iPhone, but I was 10 when I got my first, like, any, uh, it wasn't not a smartphone. So I think 12, around 12 is a good age to get your first iPhone because that's when you can start using it for, like, more things like homework and you can use the Internet on the phone. Um, anything before that, I think it's a little ridiculous to have an iPhone because there's really nothing you need it for like having just a non-smartphone is perfectly sufficient to be able to text your parents and like let them know where you are if you're going out like biking with your friends and then with the iPad um, kids using iPads when they're two I don't really see much of an issue in that if the like if the usage is limited um, I have a niece and a nephew and I know both of them use their parents iPad to watch like YouTube just like when it's at night and they just yeah, they watch like kids shows on YouTube. So it's really no different from like when we were kids and we'd watch TV. It's just on a different platform now. Mm -hmm. So I don't really see an issue in that as long as it's limited. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I got my first phone uh, before sixth grade. So sixth grade, we turned 12. I got mine the summer uh, before sixth grade. I, uh, I think it's pertinent to this discussion to talk about like why we get a cell phone um, in our own situations, as well as why people use phones and what they were meant for. Um, and the ideal use for them. Uh, my personal reason I, I believe I got it before I turned 12, which was the plan in my family, uh, was because of my brother. Having an older brother, when he got uh, his cell phone, it was kind of like I was waiting until I turned 12. Um, being a bad waiter, I think uh, that's what ended up, um, that's what allowed me to get a cell phone before then, uh, as my parents kind of falling into letting, letting me get one, um, just for asking, mm -hmm. um, eventually over time. So I, I think that it wasn't for communication. I mean, we said it was, but it wasn't really for communication, um, faster communication. But I think that focusing on why kids should get them, um, and it, not really kids, but anybody, is just to speed up being able to have a conversation with somebody else in a different place instead of having to go to them. I think that speeds up um, effect, or productivity. Uh, and effectivity of having a conversation. You can do that from two different places instead of having to be in person. Um, it changes a lot of things. I think there's a lot of uses, such as like YouTube, or I mean, I fell ill to this too, but TikTok, that kind of thing is, it, it ruins, um, it, it ruins that time productivity that phones, I think, could have been meant for. Mm -hmm. um, speaking to the iPad, I can remember the first 
like device that I got, I believe, was an iPod Shuffle, later replaced for a regular iPod um, in like first grade. Uh, so when I was like six or seven, I believe. And I think that the thing about that, the good part about kids getting uh, to use technology, their own devices early on, or not even their own devices, but any device, is that growing up in a world where you know you've talked about using Canvas and how like you don't like it because you're not used to it because you didn't grow up with a, a Canvas kind of application. We grew, we grow up with these things, so we're very good at knowing, you know, the psychology behind where things are on a web page. People who program these pages are trying to use human intuition to figure out what's going to make it easiest for my uh, user to be able to find something. So if I expect for my user to be you, I'm going to place it, you know, I'm going to place what you need in the front of your page. Canvas is trying to make the user, I think, the student more than the teacher, though also to a sub degree the teacher. Um, if they did a better job, not saying they do a bad job, but I think if they were doing a better job based on your feedback of it, they would place more pressure on, on putting pertinent items that you use for your classroom, being able to put those, customizing it in, in your own page. So you can have your whatever you use, like top of the page. Right. Let me just um, talk about you know the age of acquiring the cell phone, but now the amount of time that are on the that we spend on these devices. Um, I think it was, it's common sense media. They claim that teens spend seven hours a day on average on the phone. That does not include homework. If you add homework into the realm, now they're saying that you spend nine hours a day online. Nine. Um, you know, if we talk about Canvas, uh, we, we want people to be, I guess, more knowledgeable about technology and use it because of that sense of productivity. How do you feel about teens being online for nine hours a day? Average. I think it's scary. I mean, I'm probably well in that range of people too, but it is scary to think that like out of our entire day we're spent looking at this tiny little device filled with chips. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what do you use your phone for? Um, texting, Snapchat, Instagram, Isco. Mm -hmm. Just scroll through. When I get bored, that's like what I go to do. Right. So I think um, personally, I know I've, so iPhones a little while back added the screen time feature, which can show you like how much you're on your phone. So I know personally, I'm a little below that. I'm like about average six hours um, a day. So. I think spending nine, even six hours for myself, I think is excessive, and I've always tried to get that down. Um, I haven't been very successful doing so, but I think anything over six is getting to a point where it's just a little ridiculous, and there's no reason for somebody to be on their phone for more than six hours a day, because at that point, you're just doing the same things over and over again. You're just constantly scrolling through Instagram or looking at Twitter or playing games, and you're really not benefiting from anything you're doing. There is definitely pr productive things you can be doing on your phone for a substantial amount of time. Um, you can be doing things to help you with homework, you can be talking to people, you can check your Instagram like a couple times, um, but I think at a certain point it just gets to be too much and that's when, that's when the phones really should go away and that's when kids like fall into trouble with getting addicted to their phones. Mm -hmm. There's a lot coming out of your responses, so we're going to get to everything that is coming out, like the addiction and, but you know, Joe, I want you to add to this. Um, I think that we should be careful when we try to look at screen time in general as a, a singular number. Um, I don't think it is one number. You know, we say nine hours, but nine hours could be two hours of work that's actually benefiting the rest of, of your productivity for your life. I mean, I keep relating back to productivity, but it can be productivity, it could be happiness, uh, it could be, you know, your relationships, so other emotions. There's a lot more that comes from using your phone, I think, than, than what we see. And I think that you'd really, you'd honestly have to do a case study of, you know, what is a singular, per, singular person using their phone, or what are the average people using their phones for? Um, because you can't just say, this person's using their phone for nine hours, all of that time is, ba is badly spent, or even that the majority of that time is badly spent without actually digging into what it's being used for. So, you know, at first glance, nine hours, a little bit of a scary number, but when you split up nine hours into different things besides for homework, if you're texting with your parents, if you're, that it's pertinent, you know, discussions that have an effect on you, I, I would say that we should be able to determine, or we would need to determine what's actually good use of a cell phone uh, before you can just say, like, nine hours is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, with that, texting. Another study, Pew Research Center, says the average cell, cell phone user sends 109.5 text messages a day. I check my phone, it's, what time is it here? It's one o'clock and I've sent two text messages all day. So that means when I get home from school, I gotta really find a hundred ways to text people. I just, it does not, I just can't wrap it around my mind that, that we text on average 109. That's 3,200 texts a month. It, it, I, I know I'm, I, I'm old, but I mean, is it, are you texting 109 messages a day? Honestly, maybe, because I feel like there's so many group chats going on my phone with like between like the different like sports that I do or like camp, like, my friends, like, we don't see each other every day, so sometimes it's just texting. Other times it's, like, my friends, like, who are just kind of down the hall at school, and I'm like, hey, this just happened, or, like, blah, 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 like, let's meet here. And then my mom, so I feel like compiled, yes, like, 100 kind of sounds like a good number okay. for how many text messages I send. Yeah, I'd say that number or more sounds pretty accurate, just because, like, there's just, once conversations start, it's kind of ongoing, and it's kind of like something where kids don't want to like break up conversations and so it'll just keep going for long periods of time like throughout the day and I mean that adds up once you're talking to somebody for 30 minutes over text just like rapid fire sending text back and forth a lot like a lot of text can be sent in that time and when that might be happening with like two or three different people that can easily add up to a lot of texts. Mm -hmm. I think because we're so connected in our world we constantly need to be talking to people and like having like interactions we can't just be by ourselves for a minute so right. that's kind of like adding to it. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. Good. I, love I think it. it's great. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of an opposing view to this. Um, I guess it's not even opposing. I don't even think anybody here said that that's bad. Um, let me say I send you an email, right? I need to say five different things in my email, five different topics. In a text conversation, we could be talking about each topic separately, and it would pile up to be 100 messages back and forth, right? In an email, you know, people would say, oh, an email can solve that by sending two messages. Yeah. But the amount of time it takes to, to make that first message, check that message, and then send it, and then for you to read it, digest it, you know, send me back a message after you've, you, you know, people are scanning down their emails for you know, grammar issues, punctuation, that's a grammar issue. Right. Any, any, like they're, they're scanning their emails, they're using like Grammarly, it takes time to send one. Whereas now, with the you, text, it do you, doesn't. Do you think the texting is, in the text language, text talk or yeah. whatever it is, Efficient. is hurting, but, but the, the lack of grammar, um, yeah, the spelling definitely. mistakes, the lack of capitalization, do you think that is hurting society? Definitely. I think that people use it wrong, so yes, it is hurting society. I think if it was used correctly, it would be extremely beneficial. I mean, as a teacher, for answers on tests, I'm getting text talk. I'm getting LOL. I don't need an LOL on a test. You know what I mean? I don't need some of this emoji stuff. I got an emoji once. Um, but just the, the, no, the lack of capitalization, it's almost like the, the students, it's, and it's very short. It's like three, four, five words. It's, where did our sentences go? I yeah. think when it becomes on paper or on email, you know, there are different things that different, you know, there are different things that you should be using to communicate. So on paper, you should be using full grammar skills. Um, on an email, the same. On a letter, the same. Once you get into using online um, chatting services in a more formal setting, it becomes a little bit looser with quicker sentences. Once you become texting, it's very loose. And then on Snapchat, you can send a video. You can, you know, you can speak through a video. That's now, fine. if you're <laughs> texting your bosses, well, another statistic that I get, I have to get out there because I right. think this. Uh, on average, it takes 90 seconds for someone to respond to a text message. That's very fast. And they are saying that um, employers, uh, employees, anybody who you are texting, they are expecting that immediate gratification for you to respond to that text. Are we um, opening the door for, um, I don't know, employers to take advantage of their employees um, when they're not at work? or having family and friends take advantage of you that you have to be on at all time, at all times? I think so, because personally, like, an argument that I get in with my mom is she's always like, get off your phone, I don't want you on your phone. And then when I'm out and she texts me, I don't respond within three minutes, she's like, why aren't you responding? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, 
I'm not on my phone. Well, it doesn't count with parents. Okay, fair. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think like it causes okay. like so much stress because we're constantly looking at our phones to see if we get messages and like I don't know about you guys, but like when I do homework, I'll like turn it upside down and like every five minutes I'm like, oh no, mm -hmm. did you get a message? Or I'm like, oh yep, do. And then I instantly get distracted from that. I think it's bad because it r ruins our attention spans and like we're just constantly focused on like getting messages and like getting notifications and seeing that like light up screen. So I definitely think it's like more taking advantage of our brains and distracting mm -hmm. us from. I can definitely else. relate to the um, the thing you said about doing homework, just like having your phone like within arm's reach and constantly like every few minutes be checking it and then like getting distracted for like 20 minutes, which seems like no time at all, but then you've wasted like 20 minutes of doing your homework. But going back to like the 90 second stat, um, I think it completely depends on the person that you're receiving the text from. Um, as to how fast you'll respond. I can definitely say if I get a text from, because my bosses at work will text me asking me to come in or just asking me different things. And I, um, I can confidently say that it doesn't bother me to not respond to their text for two, three hours mm -hmm. or however That's long. That's what I like to hear. Yeah. That's right. Keep however, on waiting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say it definitely depends on the person. Like if there's people that you haven't talked to in a long time and they're just asking you a question or something, maybe you'll take a little longer to respond. And yeah, so I would just say it's completely dependent on the person. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's definitely not a problem when it mm -hmm. comes to um, like the workplace, for me at least. Okay. Uh, I would say, I would relate this back to opportunity cost. Um, you know, we can talk on and on about all these different reasons why cell phones are good and bad, but at the end of the day, it, it, we have to weigh the the benefits that we are getting from cell phones, not just for adults, because you know when we say benefits, we we might say, oh, in the adult world now we can work so much faster. What does it do to kids? Oh, now they they don't know how to write or read um, correctly because they're doing it with this new uh, language that they've made up. I think or or shifted from the old one. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of bad and there's a lot of good. Um, looking at it from the perspective of what's it going to do to future generations, I think we could have a lot of conversations about what are the bad things, but we would have many fewer conversations about the good things because we're so used to them. Um, in talking about the 90 second thing, I can say that uh, I don't work, um, I don't have a regular work schedule, so I work for the school for the tech department, um, and because we're part of a school organization, we don't have a communication service other than emailing. Um, we could use your mind, but we don't have we don't you know discuss things at a frequency enough to, to need to speak at that um, that speed. We have conversations at that speed, except when we do need to discuss things. You know, if I if I need some materials for something, it, we need them fast because we don't realize until we're there because it's, it's so so many different people are are in the hands uh, of doing the tech. Um, but I would say that when. When I am doing jobs, I work over the summer at a camp, and, and if I do get a text from a boss when I'm working it there, it's very different. It needs to happen very quickly, and it happens much faster um, when we have a, a cell phone, or um, I would say the next level of a cell phone is a radio, um, like a handheld radio. Usually, I mean, in take the Army or any, any military branch usually has very quick signals for using radios because they need to... Uh, transmit a lot of information over that, that radio very quickly, um, and they have rules around what they can use. I think kids are creating these rules about what they can do on these radios, and depending on the median, or on, on their cell phones, depending on the, uh, the median of, of where, what they're communicating with, I think the response time changes. Um, so I would say that it's good in some ways that we are able to have a service that I can expect a response. You know, if I'm doing tons of homework and I text Jake, you know, what was that work that we needed to do for math class? And he responds within 90 seconds. That's a good use of a cell phone. But now, how do you if feel Jake if, was Jake for a test, if Jake doesn't respond? Because now this is what happens, side. right? So now what you introduce um, cell phones, you introduce text messages, you, 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 you open the, the line of communication, and now you text Jake and Jake ghosts you, doesn't text you back. You text somebody else. No one. How do you? How does that make you feel? Because you've been gratified so much, right? Mm -hmm. With and then all of a sudden, Jake says sometimes, at least with his employer, he doesn't get back for two or three hours. How does that honestly make you feel? I think that there is a psychological uh, language that's being created about when you reply and when you don't. When you don't reply within that amount of time, um, it creates this. It's it's this message that's being sent. Um, 
at least you know subconsciously that this person doesn't want to talk to you and then mm -hmm. now we've started having that conversation out loud when people are left on red or well, you know. and there's these are all these to topics about because it, you can read there are articles and articles about the psychological impact of cell phones and we know cell phones smartphones uh, they they are important they they are a positive um, they, they make positive impacts in business, in school. I mean, when we're in class, I say to a kid, somebody asks a question, and I don't know it, and we're like, okay, let's Google it, let's find out. We, get, we can find that information out. Um, but there's the negative part of cell phones. There's, it's the deep, dark, ugly world of he or she didn't respond to me. They sent me a nasty text. I responded. I got nothing back. Um, this one's saying horrible things about me. Oh, in this group chat, they said that. I mean, it's just, or they didn't respond. It's, it's just, I, I feel almost like when you get a cell phone or you say your kid is ready at 12, that we give driving lessons to kids who sit in a car. I really think there should be lessons about the phone and phone etiquette. And, on, and I know we do that at Algonquin in Computer Essentials. We do a little... Um, topic about social media and online bullying, and but I almost think it's too late. That it's too late little, at fifteen and fourteen. Yeah. Big government to me to say, you know, well, let's teach our kids in, like in school. I I would say that it's a good conversation to have. I don't know if it's you know something that we need to create a, a school for. I think because um, I think that ruins some of the productivity. I honestly think that at the end of the day, we could go on this discussion about back and forth and back and forth about every single different issue with cell phones and every single different benefit that we get from cell phones. At the end of the day, the most important thing somebody can do from this conversation if they're watching is to say to themselves, okay, where in my life can I realize what a cell phone has done, good or bad, and have respect for the fact that it has some good and it does have some bad. Um, and to be able to stop yourself when you are feeling the bad part of it. Um, and I mean, you don't have to be overly grateful, but to be a little grateful for the fact that it does provide some good. Uh, so being able to have that gratitude for the good and bad things it does, I think is extremely important because then you can say, you know what, no, I gotta put my phone down, it's time to study versus, nope, it's actually, this is a very important conversation to the other person and to myself that I need to be having. And see, you are mature enough to to say, hey, I need to put my phone down. And, and I'm 18 and a 12-year-old is a 12-year-old. Right, but no, but, but I mean, even 55-year-olds uh, can't put their cell phone down. I mean, I love going out to eat, and I look at a couple, and they're both on their cell phones, and I'm feeling, hey, you, could you put that down? Maybe, I mean, I'm not even part of the, the dinner, and I'm like, can you put that down so we can talk to each other? I feel sad. And, and, but there is a, um, a name for a cell phone addiction. It's called nomophobia. And one of the therapies... Um, that they prescribe, and this is mostly for kids and teens, um, to deal with this is to ban their, they take their cell phone away for two weeks. Can't use it. That's the, on the kid's own volunteer or that's somebody, no, that's, the other parents? No, uh, that's yeah, a, a parent or, or uh, a medical professional says, listen, we're going to take this phone away for two weeks. I think that's great. You think it's great? I go, um, I'm a counselor now, so I do have my phone on me, although mm -hmm. the campers don't know that, but when I was a camper, I went for six years, I wasn't allowed to have my phone for a month, and it was the best. Like, you don't think about anything that's happening outside the world, and then you come back, and it's almost like you don't want to go back to your phone because you don't want to get caught up in all the messages, and then, like, all of a sudden, you have to start responding to people, and then you feel the urge to have to respond to people within, like, the 90 seconds. I, like, talk to people all the time. Um, so you think periodic breaks may be a good? Yeah, because I think it helps you realize, like, how much you can do without your cell phone, mm -hmm. and I feel like over the summer, like, I get away from that, and then the second I get back, or not the second, but like within like two weeks, I'm already back and I'm wrapped up in like mm -hmm. my phone. I think that it's a good, if a kid is so addicted to his phone that he needs to have it taken away for two weeks, I think that's definitely a good way to like subside the addiction and make the kid be less dependent on his phone. But I think the, re I mean the real problem is that a kid could get so addicted to his phone that his parents need to take it away from him for two, two, two weeks just so he's not on it as much. I think, um, the bigger focus should be not letting kids get that addicted to it. And if a kid is that addicted to his phone, he might not be mature enough to have a phone because he doesn't know when to put it down. He doesn't know when it's appropriate, when and when not to use it. So I'd say that's like the bigger overlying issue here. But if it's necessary, I'd say going without your phone for that period of time is um, a good way to treat it. But like I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary for 
uh, people that aren't necessarily addicted to their phones to go without their phones for weeks or months mm -hmm. at a time or whatever it may be. I would say that you're actually, when you say that, you know, you're not mature enough for your phone, I think that that means that nobody's mature enough for their phone these days. The idea of not only giving people who have a phone addiction, but also the general people, anybody who uses a phone, um, regardless of whether or not they know how to use their phone, I mean, if they know how to use their phone and they know when to put it down and have real time um, with, with other people around them or real time with their work, that's, that's fine, that's great. But anybody else who doesn't really realize that and, and doesn't actively choose to do that, I think it might be important to have a break. You know, I um, hate to pull religion into this. I'm Jewish, and part of the Jewish holidays is that you put your phone down. You put all electricity away. Um, and you know what? There, there are some bad parts of that. There's, you know, no way to uh, turn on and off lights. So you want to go to bed, you have to use a physical, um, some, some physical way to, to turn on and off a light. So they've come up with solutions for that, for, for lights in bedrooms and whatnot. Um, but any, anywhere else that a light is off and you want to use the room, you have to open the window. And if it's not light out, you know, we're back to 14th century or whatever. You know, right. we're, we're back before there was any light. So. But what, what is the, what's the point of that? What's what? my point of bringing that up? No, no, no. Or, what's, what's the point? What's the point of that? Of, of, um, yeah, of I that. I think, so what, what that is, and I, it plays very well into de today, um, just loosely or indirectly, I would say, not loosely at all. Um, I would say it's indirectly related to today because it's, it's about being mindful of what's, what the uh, holiday is about, or mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, what the holiday is about. It, for my family, we do it strictly during the high holidays. Uh, in, in a general sense, we don't exactly follow it um, that well. Uh, I mean, I can't get into like, what my own family does. Sure, no, but, 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 um, it's, but, but, with, when we're, but I will say, when, when we are with our, our cousins and, our, and the rest of our family, we have some very strict members of our family who follow the religion um, closely, and when we are with them, we're one respectful that they don't want to be around it. It's not for them to be around, and two, it's partly like we are internally motivated not to use our phones because when we use our phones, you know, we want to have that good relationship with them, and we feel, I think, partially that you know, this is it's not it's not a great relationship if we are completely disregarding what they want. Right. So I think that you know there are parts to it. It's that's externally motivating when you're younger, where it's your parents saying, no, don't do that, we're taking this away. Mm -hmm. That's an external thing, that's an sure. external factor. When you are able to say to yourself, you know what, this is great. Like this year, this was the first time that I was like, this is an amazing time for myself. When I'm a uh, counselor at camp, I teach uh, boating classes on the water. When I'm away from my phone, so I can't bring it out there with me, it's, it's some of the best time. It's you relaxing, know? you actually like stop worrying for a second. And exactly. Like now let me throw this really radical idea out. All right. What if Algonquin bans cell phones from 7.15 to 1.50, a forced disconnect, like going to camp? Yeah. How do you See, think that... I think students. there's like ups and downs to it because at least for camp, I'm not leaving. I'm there. Right. I have nowhere to be. Nobody I have to go pick up. Nobody that has to come get me, find out where I am. Like, I'm within like a mile radius of myself, like right. of everybody. When you're at school, there's like places to go, there's sport teams, there's updates, there's weather, there's all these different things that like come into play. So like in an ideal world, I think that would be great because then we could actually come in here and like focus on things. Mm -hmm. No, we couldn't check Canvas on our phones, but like we could like actually get to like learn and stop focusing on like messages. But like with everything else, I feel like with school that just like could not work. Mm -hmm. um, outside of parent communication, I would say it's definitely like feasible to have kids put away their phones from the time they get into school um, until the time they leave. I would say parents would probably be pretty upset if the school took away the kids' privileges to their phone. Some parents, because they would feel like they wouldn't be able to contact their kids. But outside of that, I think it could, be, it could work and it could definitely be a good idea because there is really no reason for kids to be on their phones uh, during like, the duration of class, during the duration of school. Um, except for certain activities that sometimes teachers will make you do, but now we have the BYOD policy, so if every kid still brings a computer, that could, all those activities can still be performed with the computer. Mm -hmm. So I think it would most likely be beneficial. I don't know if it's necessarily possible to have kids put away their phones uh, for the entire day, but I think it could promote a better learning environment overall. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's impractical, uh, and it's not the same thing as camp. Um, would I love to come to school and not need my phone? Sure. 
the work that I do, um, you know, my activities in the school, I think it makes it kind of necessary to have my phone. I think, you know, going back to that, being able to be reverent of when you're using your phone and when it's good and bad, um, and respecting when it's bad and saying, you know what, let me put my phone down, um, is very important to this conversation, more so than the idea of externally motivating people to stop using their phones by saying no. You can, um, you can use, I think, I, I would say it's not necessarily the school's responsibility, but I think it, it indirectly would very much improve the uh, work we're doing here. Um, and it's just one factor out of many to make kids not want to use their phones. Um, and this would have an effect in many other places because what I'm saying is, you know, externally motivating kids using an activity that makes them internally motivated to put their phone down and be present in the moment. You know, so at camp, Elle and I, I think, are saying we want we are not putting our phones down because the rules say to put your phone down. That's well, part of it. You, I'm, yeah. But I, I think for your one and my one too, we would rather be there than be somewhere else on our phones. So you're saying you'd you'd rather be anywhere else but school. That's why you're on your phones at school. I wouldn't yes. say we'd rather be anywhere else than school. But I would say that maybe on the beach somewhere. Yes, maybe sometimes. I think sometimes I would rather. But yeah, if I'm on the beach and I have my phone away, it's probably because I'm enjoying myself. Right. Right. Yes. Not because I am just like I, I'm. I have a rule put on me not to use my phone. Right. We have some audience questions. If you'd like, if you could just be patient here, and so we have a few studio audience members who would like to ask the panel a few things. Uh, my name is Horace, and my question is, how many phones have you had in your lifetime? Um, I think I've had three or four. Um, I get an update every year, I'm pretty sure. Um, our plan, we get free updates. I got my first one when I was 12. Yeah, I think I'm on my fourth. About. Um, I think I've had three phones. I got my first phone, um, I think, for my 14th birthday. And then a month later, I dropped it in the ocean. So then I got a new phone. And then I got an update about a year later. So I think I'm on my third phone right now. I'm on my fourth phone. Uh, my first phone was a Nokia. Uh, and my teacher insulted Nokias when I was in sixth grade. Mm. Uh, so much so that I, I felt like uh, I was being personally attacked. So I could not have a Nokia. So the next year, I switched to an iPhone. Uh, and then I used an iPhone for a while, and then I realized I did not like the iPhone. Well, not that I didn't like the iPhone, but I, I wanted more freedom, so I went to an Android. And I got the freedom of an Android, but nobody else was with me because everybody else was using an iPhone. So, of course, what do I do? I switch back to an iPhone, and there we are on phone number four, um, which is, I think, that's its own conversation to have why we switch back and forth between different, why we, why we use the phones we do and what the, um, the brand of phone we have, uh, how the brand brands are affecting you know our choices right. yeah. let me just ask the audience the camera won't see you but how many of you in here have iphones is that everybody no one two three four five six <laughs> 17 ish 18 who does not have an iphone Hearts. one two two so um oh, i have some people over here in that's the okay. audio uh, room no iphones um, so that's a pretty interesting stat. It's interesting but that they raise their hands. Interesting that they raise their hands, and good for you. Um, You're free. Uh, who else has questions? My name is Patrick, and I'm wondering, when do you think it's appropriate to use phones in regards to restaurants or any public place? I'm going to take that one. Um, <laughs> I think that, say you're at dinner with your family, I think that it's not necessarily not appropriate to check your phone once or twice. Um, if you want to look at it and you get a text and you respond to it quickly, I think that's fine. As long as it, um, like my family's always had a policy where you can't be on your phones at dinner, but my parents won't get mad if I check a text and I respond to it fast and then put my phone away. So as long as you're not on, on your phone for more than maybe 20, 30 seconds at a time and then you're back in the conversation, um, I think there's no problem with that. I think it's better to be off your phone completely, but I'd say it's not um, inappropriate to maybe check it once or twice. I think it's like a disrespect at some point when you're talking to somebody or you're at dinner and like you take out your phone. I think like 20, 30 seconds, maybe check a text message like if something happens. But um, if I'm at dinner with somebody or like just talking with somebody and they whip out their phone and start going like this, like I take that as disrespect because 
you're supposed to be listening to me or like we're having a conversation and I feel like that's just taking away from like you caring about what I have to say. And that's the what the teachers so. are saying too. Like here yeah. we are talking to you and it's slightly disrespectful when we're speaking and you're doing. I would say it's completely disrespectful because what we're, what we're doing when, we're, when we pick our phone up, what we're doing is basically saying, Ms. Rufo, you don't matter to me yes. as much as this text might. Well, what would you say last time? Like you're, when you're enjoying life, you're not on your phone. When you're, like, yes, you're sitting on the exactly. beach, so I'm not enjoying your presence. I might as well look at my phone. That's but the, how I the take difference it. with this is that I'm saying there is a possibility that what's happening on my phone might be better than you. It could just be my you know, weather app saying you know, the weather is, is going to be cloudy today in the afternoon. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm not outside, of course. I'm in the industrialized environment of Algonquin Regional High School. I'm great. Um, I don't care what the weather is outside, but I do care if it's my mom saying, hi, come home, the dog is missing. Like, that's mm -hmm. like something that I care more than you teaching me about pro you know, profits and losses. True. But the thing is that students are now saying, <laughs> they are now saying, it doesn't matter whether or not it's my mom or my weather app. Mm -hmm. It's more important than you, Ms. Rufo. That's right. And that's disrespectful. And regardless of whether or not the, it's valid, what, the reason you're checking your phone, the possibility that you might not have something important going on in your phone, but yet you are still checking, checking it is, is awful. I think it, it proves you, that there is a problem with this. Thank you. Uh, we do have a final question in the, from the audience. <laughs> My name is Zach, and my question is, do you have any fears uh, with cell phones when it comes to your privacy? Yeah. I feel like so many different things. Like, I don't know about you guys, but, like, personally, like, I don't want my, like, not that I don't want my mom looking at what I'm doing, but I just feel like I'm not doing anything bad. I don't need her to be, like, watching it. But I feel like there's so many easy ways for, like, little things to get out there, and people share information so quickly, like, a picture that you send to a friend, even if it's not bad, like it could get anywhere like so fast or like things just move so quickly that like I'm more nervous about like how quickly things get out there, more like I guess like my privacy. Mm -hmm. But um, I wouldn't say I'm worried about privacy on my phone. Um, yeah, I feel like everything that like I do on my phone is not necessary. I mean, it's not something that I'd want other people to see, but it's also not anything I'm worried about other people finding out about, like I'm not worried about like my parents or anybody else getting into my phone and like checking what I'm doing. So yeah, I wouldn't say privacy is really a, word, a worry for me um, when it comes to phones. Um, yeah, I'm not worried at all, honestly. Um, you are all doing exactly what I'm doing with my phone. Uh, I don't do bad things with my phone. I'm, I'm not, you know, trying to contact Russia and, and make some like weapons deal with my phone. So it's, it's honestly like, I have, I have things to hide, of course. I'm a, I've, I am a private person with my life, but at the same time, so are you all, and you all have, are using the same phone as I am. Um, you know, I think people in high places live, with, uh, live in glass houses, and people with cell phones now live in glass houses too, and if that uh, makes us all better people, um, so be it. Uh, I think it's, it's terrible how little privacy we have these days, but at the same time, we all have very low privacy. So, you know, I would rather have more, but if you have it, if you have as little privacy as I have, um, you know, we, we're equal on that. And I think that's not the bad part. The bad part is when people take advantage of it, of course. Um, but I would also say that at this point, I'm, I'm not exactly worried about myself because of the fact that everybody else um, is the same. We're all in it. All in it together. Every, everybody's information is being read. Exactly. Pictures My glass house is taken. a neighbor to yours, and there I can see you right through and, and on to the next one. It's great, right? What yeah. a ha happy yeah. way to end it. What, what do we? What do we have, Ella? I was just gonna say, like, maybe I'm not like worried about like other people, like, I guess, like, seeing what I'm doing because I'm like, am not doing anything like bad, but like, also just like everybody like knows where you are all the time, like, knows what you're doing, like. How many know, of that's you? That's the part wait. that I don't like. How many of you have a f your parents have fine? find my friend app on your yeah. phone or whatever. Or, I turned or it off. You turned it off, but they tried. It was a good try. Yeah. Yes. Well, I just said, like, my mom wasn't tracking she was a kid. Right. I don't want, like, I'm not going any, like, I feel like there's a matter of trust, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I'll tell you where I'm going. Do you track your friends? Mm -hmm. No. No. 
A lot of people have s- a lot of people on do. Snapchat have Snap. There's yeah. this thing called Snap Maps, and they'll have theirs turned. I have mine turned off, mm-hmm. so they have it turned on, and you can just open the Snap Map and see where they are at any time, yeah. which has always just been kind of weird to me. It's kind of creepy because oh. I see, can see why some parents like, like track their kids' phones. I don't agree with it, but I mean, obviously, I see the reason behind it. But I just there's no reason why you should ever. I I would think you would ever want your friends to know where you are mm-hmm. to be able to know where you are at any time of the day. Right. I think cell phone tracking, um, it's part of another discussion about, you know, what does, the fact that we're limiting kids on, on how much they can do, I think, plays into this, you know, kids aren't rebelling when they think things are wrong. Um, and it, it causes a lot of problems that are for another conversation. I would say, could we all end with saying, at the end of this discussion, this could go on for days and days. Yes, we need to end it. But c- can each person give one piece of advice for just what to do now with your phone? You go first. I'm not uh, very good at giving advice. All right, once we get to you, then. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be, as I said, to to, uh, be respectful of when you realize it's bad. um, Your phone's having a bad effect on you, uh, but also when it's having a good effect, and be grateful that we have them, but also be respectful of when they're not being used right. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the same thing. I was just going to say learn when to put your phone away. I think cell phones can be very productive, and they can be a positive thing for our lives as long as we're not using them in excess and we're keeping it in moderation. So I'd say just learn to know when to not use your phone and then it can benefit you more than it will negatively affect you. This is kind of like similar, but, or not similar, but um, get a watch, not an Apple watch, just like that has a time. Because half the time we check our phones and we see the time, but then we see like eight like notifications and we get distracted. So just get like a plain watch with the time and then you won't have to constantly be looking at notifications. I think my advice would be to make sure you have the Amazon app on your phone and make sure you buy some nice presents for your parents and your teachers under 25 for the teacher. And I think life will be good. So I think that's it for us today. Uh, Thank you for joining us with Money Talks. And we will probably have 25 other episodes about cell phones in the future. Thank you very much.